Good afternoon. It is one minute past three and I'm trying out my new chair and it moves and it's a the just the right shape bucket chair or whatever chub chair they call them. And it, it just I've only it's only just been put together by David, my neighbour. It arrived a couple of days ago, but I didn't ask him until today. I was out feeding the birds and the girls were <whistles> swooping down on me. I said, Lord, don't let them hurt me. <laughs> they attack you. Uh, protecting the baby girl that can't fly. Anyway, the chair is here and uh, it feels lovely. It's velvet green, so it even feels nice, the material. It's beautiful. I think I got it on eBay. It was £60 but it's worth every pound, I think. It feels comfortable. So that will be it. I hope it'll help my backache. It doesn't hurt right this minute. So now I'm going to share with you the Mass Liturgical Readings for Thursday, 10th week in Ordinary Time, Year 1, Thursday, 15th of June, 2023. I will not begin with a lot of prayers like yesterday and then get carried away. I'll just do the minimum. I hope you can hear me. The microphone is to my left, piled up on all the books. I might bring it a little nearer. Um, then we will begin. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side, to light, to guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Prayer to Saint Michael the Archangel. Defend us in the day of battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do you, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, Cast into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl through the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The prayer before reading sacred scripture. Open my heart, O Holy Spirit, to receive your inspired word. Grant me wisdom to understand what you want to teach me and strength of will to follow wherever you lead. Amen. Oh. The first reading is from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 3, 15, then 4, verse 1, and 3 to 6. And the theme, God has shone in our minds to radiate the light of the knowledge of God's glory. Even today, whenever Moses is read, the veil is over their minds. It will not be removed until they turn to the Lord. Now this Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we with our unveiled faces, reflecting like mirrors the brightness of the Lord, all grow brighter and brighter as we are turned into the image that we reflect. This is the work of the Lord, who is Spirit. Since we have, by an act of mercy, been entrusted with this work of administration, there is no weakening on our part. If our gospel does not penetrate the veil, then the veil is on those who are not on the way to salvation. The unbelievers, whose minds the God of this world has blinded, to stop them seeing the light 
shed by the good news of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For it is not ourselves that we are preaching, but Christ Jesus as the Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. It is the same God that said, Let there be light shining out of darkness. Who has shone in our minds to radiate the light of the knowledge of God's glory, the glory on the face of Christ? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Reading from Psalm 84 and the response. The glory of the Lord will dwell in our land. The glory of the Lord will dwell in our land. I will hear what the Lord God has to say. A voice that speaks of peace. His help is near for those who fear him and his glory will dwell in our land. The glory of the Lord will dwell in our land. Mercy and faithfulness have met. Justice and peace have embraced. Faithfulness shall spring from the earth and justice look down from heaven. The glory of the Lord will dwell in our land. The Lord will make us prosper and our earth shall yield its fruit. Justice shall march before him and peace shall follow his steps. The glory of the Lord will dwell in our land. Alleluia! Alleluia, Alleluia. Accept God's message it for what it really is. God's message and not some human thinking. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. 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 I give you a new commandment. Love one another, just as I have loved you, says the Lord. Alleluia. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, verses 20 to 26. Glory to you, O Lord. And the theme, anyone who is angry with his brother will answer for it before the court. Jesus said to his disciples, If your virtue goes no deeper than that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. You have learnt how it was said to our ancestors, you must not kill. And if anyone does kill, he must answer for it before the court. But I say this to you, anyone who is angry with his brother will answer for it before the court. If a man calls his brother fool, he will answer for it before the Sanhedrin. And if a man calls him renegade, he will answer for it in hellfire. So then, if you are bringing your offering to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your offering there before the altar. Go and be reconciled with your brother first. And then come back and present your offering. 
come to terms with your opponent in good time while you are still on the way to the court with him or he may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you will be thrown into prison I tell you solemnly you will not get out till you've paid the last penny the gospel of the Lord and isn't like that with families I have four children that I gave birth to and I'm not on good terms with any of those four is my adopted children and my spiritual children who are always in touch. I had a, re a re lovely, uh, what do you call it, video call. One of them called me just before I began recording and saying how much she missed being with me and seeing me. We used to live near one another closely in Manchester for a long while. And um, I love when I get those messages and calls and face-to-face -face things. My own children could do that, but the, all the answers I get, um, I'll lump them all together as those that are any way in contact. Uh, busy. They're always busy. Always busy. Busy, busy, busy. Am I going to see you this year? Yes, in the summer. So I actually sent the youngest of my girls. She was born in 1967. Uh a long message. I was going to write her a letter and then I thought that'll go in the bin. So a WhatsApp text her. She hasn't responded. That was the early hours of a day or so ago. And uh, you, I always try. I may be in the wrong, but if I am in the wrong, I would like to be told. But when you're not told, you just guess and wonder. But it's been going on a long time. So we have to make, as a Christian, we have to make an effort. If we are in the wrong, we know what we've done wrong. We have to try and, and make amends for that. But if we don't know, we have to keep trying to find out what we've done. So there's a striking image of our calling as Christians in today's first reading. Paul declares that we are to reflect like mirrors the brightness of the Lord. So I'm obviously not reflecting the brightness of the Lord or I hate to say it maybe I'm I'm reflecting it too much with my daughters because they don't want to know they do not want to know the Lord I would probably be shocked if I found one of them out of the three was going to church in any shape or form so maybe it's that I don't know I have to wait to be told as we reflect the Lord's brightness, Paul says, we ourselves grow brighter and brighter until eventually we are turned into the one who we reflect. Well, I'm a long way from that, so it, that's not the reason that they're not in touch. It must be something else. <laughs> Paul then states that all of this is the work of the Lord who is the Spirit. It is a very powerful vision of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It is through the power of the Spirit that we reflect or we should reflect the Lord's brightness, that we grow brighter and brighter. I wish I did. I pray for that. Until we become the one whom we reflect. This work of the Spirit will never be complete in this life. It is only beyond this earthly life that we will be fully conformed to the image of God's Son. Yet the Holy Spirit is constantly trying to move us here and now towards this glorious destiny. So we should never give up on our loved ones, our children, our friends, even our enemies, we must still be trying to be as Christ wishes us to be like him. We must keep trying and keep praying, never give up. We just have to hope that the Lord will be able to fulfill our prayers after we've gone even. 
The words of Jesus in the Gospel reading suggest what it means for us to reflect the brightness of the Lord, to be continually turning into his image. It involves acquiring what Jesus refers to there as a deeper virtue, a virtue that goes deeper than action spiritual, touching our inner core. It is the spirit who forms this deeper virtue within us, a virtue that impacts on our emotions as much as on our words and actions. Jesus not only forbids killing, as the Jewish law does, but warns against the deep feelings of anger. We mustn't be angry. That's difficult for many people. Just difficult for mothers, parents, with, with kids that get on their nerves, growing up, irritating them and stuff. Some of them are lovely, but not all. Some of them are so naughty, it's unbelievable. So, deep feelings of anger can lead to killing. The creating of this deeper virtue is the good work that the Lord has begun in us. That's why I hate war. We don't want war. This war shouldn't be going on. It should have been stopped because the ultimate thing is it will end up nuclear and we're all obliterated. All of us. That war must be stopped now. They must talk. They must talk peace and not put down things that have to be put down and sorted out before they talk peace. That's nonsense. Anyway, I must refer back to the scriptures, not to the war, but the wars, we're close to it. We're very close to it. So that's why I mention it sometimes. We're, we're very, very close to it. We're as close to it now, if not closer, than we were in President Kennedy's time. It's serious, and it's being hidden from many millions in the West, in America and Great Britain. Nobody knows how close we are, but we are very close to nuclear war. It's serious, very serious. So, the Lord has begun in us and wants to bring to completion through the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives, to the extent that we allow the Spirit to form this deeper virtue in us, we will reflect even more fully the brightness of the Lord's loving nature. So we have a lot to pray about. Pray for more outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we must pray for world peace and for someone just want maybe even the relative of, of John F. Kennedy could, could, could be like his uncle that he he's still very active um, nephew of, 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 of President Kennedy and his father I believe was Robert Kennedy he would be a good man to try and talk to Putin Putin won't say no definitely won't say no he didn't want war, but he had no options. He did, Well, he, we all have options, but he's just defending his country and they want it defended. They're all with him. They're not against him, which is what America pleads. Anyway, I don't want to end with that. I want to talk about um, the, a saint. Today's whoever the saint is. Sorry about the knocking. I thought they'd finish the... Um, that they're coming back in the morning to do more drilling and everything. So we're hearing a bit of knocking from next door, which they did tell me they were fixing a, a wardrobe or having a built-in wardrobe. So I'm now going to look for 15th of the month of June and see who the saint is. Okay. I'll pull this to me rather than me try to move this chair. It's, not, it's on a round, a round thing. It's not on wheels, which is lovely. 
it moves round but it won't go forward and back which is good so I'm going to share with you a saint <laughs> what a name <laughs> Vitus Modestus and Crescentia they're martyrs they died for Christ in AD 300 question mark the cultus of these three saints goes back to very early times. Their names appear in the so-called martyrology of Saint Jerome or Hieroni Mayanum, that's Latin, and it may take as certain that they were actually Christians who gave their lives for the faith in the Roman province of Lusania, Luc yeah, Lusania in southern Italy. Nothing is known of their true story or of the circumstances of their martyrdom. Their very date is a matter of conjecture. It is quite possible that they were natives of Sicily, as tradition asserts. But their legends are fantastic compilations of a much later time. The reputed relics of St. Vitus were conveyed to St. Denis in Paris in 775 and from thence were translated, that means moved or carried, to Corvey or New Corby in Saxony in 836. So great was the devotion to him, which developed in Germany, that he was included among the 14 holy helpers. He came to be regarded as the special protector of epileptics as well as those suffering from the nervous affection called after him St Vitus's dance. I remember hearing about that as a child. And he is regarded as the patron of dancers and actors. He was also invoked against storms, oversleeping, the bites of mad dogs, the bites of serpents, and against all injuries that beasts can do to men. Hence he is often represented accompanied by an animal. The story told in the popular legend may be summarised as follows. Vitus was the only son of a senator of Sicily named Hylas. The boy was converted to Christianity at the age of seven or twelve and was baptised without the knowledge of his parents. The numerous miracles and conversions he effected, however, attracted the notice of Valerian, the administrator of Sicily, who joined with Hylas in trying to detach him from the faith but neither promises nor threats nor even torture could shake the boy's constancy. Moved by divine inspiration, Vitus escaped from Sicily with his tutor, Modestus, and his attendant, Crescentia. An angel guided their boat safely to Lusania, where they remained for a time preaching the gospel to the people and sustained by food brought them by an eagle, they then went to Rome and St Vitus cured the son of the emperor Diocletian by expelling the evil spirit which possessed him. But because he would not sacrifice to the gods, his powers were attributed to sorcery. He was cast into a cauldron filled with molten lead, pitch and resin, from which he emerged 
as from a refreshing bath. A lion to which he was exposed crouched before him and licked his feet. Then Modestus, Crescentia and he were racked on the iron horse until their limbs were dislocated. At this juncture, a great storm arose, which destroyed many temples, killing a multitude of pagans. An angel now descended from heaven, set the martyrs free, and led them back to Lucania, where they peacefully expired, worn out by their sufferings. Well, anybody else would have been dead. <laughs> so, so that's the end of their story. So the next saint is also a martyr and called Saint Heishi Chaius Martyr, A.D. 302, question mark. All we know about St. Hais Chaius is derived from the Acts, admittedly genuine, of St. Julius, a martyr of Durastorum in Moesia, the present Silistria in Bulgaria, about the year 302. When St. Julius was being led to execution, Hesychia said to him, I pray, Julius, that you may happily complete your sacrifice and receive the crown, and that I may follow you. My warmest greetings to Pasicrates and Valentius. These were two other Christians of their acquaintance, who had been martyred a very short time before. Julius embraced Hasey Chaius and replied, Brother, make haste to come. They have already heard your message. I can see them now standing beside me, even as I see you. The execution of St. Hasey Chaius actually took place after that of his friend. St. Hesychius, maybe, martyr of Duros Torum, is honoured in the Hieron Mayanum on June 15th and also in the present Roman martyology. Father Delahay identifies him with St. Hesse Chaius from the Eastern Church, assigns to Constantinople and venerates together with some anonymous companions on May the 19th. It is highly probable that the remains of St. Hesse Chaius were taken to Constantinople, the inhabitants of which, like some other places, were apt to claim as local martyrs any saints whose relics had been translated, taken or moved thither from elsewhere. That's the end of that story of the... Uh, those. But there's more. There is this saint called Saint Tatian Dulas Martyr, also AD, question mark 310. About the year 310, a prefect of Cilicia named Maximus held an assize on the promontory of Zephyrium. The first prisoner to be brought before him was a well-known local Christian who had been arrested for his faith. Questioned as to his name, he said that it was Tatianus, but that he was commonly called Dulas, and something that looks like it's in Greek letters. He was indeed the servant of Christ. As he refused to worship the gods, the magistrate ordered that he should be beaten to bring him to his senses. 
While the lashes were being administered, he rejoiced aloud that he was counted worthy to confess Christ's holy name. Afterwards also, under cross-examination, he displayed great spirit and did not scruple to denounce the heathen deities as wood and stone, the work of men's hands. Do you call the great god Apollo a work of men's hands? demanded the prefect sternly. Dulas, in reply, cited Apollo's unsuccessful pursuit of Daphne and scoffingly asked how a being so unchaste and so powerless could possibly be regarded as a god. The indignant judge ordered him to be scourged across the stomach and then roasted on a gridiron. Even these tortures did not daunt the confessor. The following day, when again led to the court, he once more began to deride the gods and was punished by having hot curls applied to his head and pepper thrust up his nostrils. Although he refused to eat food which had been offered in sacrifice, some of it was forced down his throat. He was then strung up and his flesh was torn with iron rakes. Maximus was the day was that day returning to Tarsus and had given orders that all Christian prisoners should be led after him in chains. But Dulas was so completely shattered by his sufferings that he died after the convoy started. His body was cast into a ditch where it was discovered by a shepherd's dog. The Christians obtained possession of the relics and gave them an honourable burial. The next saint, there's quite a lot of small writing under that, but I can't read it. The next saint is Saint Orsiaeus, it's O-R-S-I-E-S-I-U-S, -S -S -S. obviously it's a Latin Roman name, Orsiaeus, abbot. A.D. 380. While Pacomius was ruling the great communities, he formed a Tabernice at Tabernice and elsewhere in the Egyptian desert. He numbered among his disciples two quite young men of exceptional promise. Their names were Orsiaeus and Horsiaeci and Theodore. Pacomius trained them with special care, often made them his travelling companions and even consulted them about the rule he was composing. But when he set Orsiaeus over the monastery of Kenoboski, some of the older monks murmured at the appointment of so young a man. Is the kingdom of God then only for the old? asked Pacomius. And he went on to prophesy that Orsiaeus would one day diffuse the splendour of the golden lamp over the house of God. Petronius, who succeeded Pacomius, only survived his predecessor by 15 days. Orsiaeus was then chosen to fill his place. Two, two, two deputations sent from Tabis, Tabenisi to St. Anthony and St. Athanasius to inform them of the death of Pacomius and the election of Orsiaeus. Both those great saints spoke in terms of high praise of their new superior. 
Saint Orsiasius indeed proved a holy ruler, but after a time his strictness in enforcing the regulations about prof- property provoked discontent in certain monasteries, not immediately under his eye. The opposition increased until at length he felt unable to cope with it. Rather than be the occasion of a cleavage, he resigned in favour of St Theodore, who however accepted office with the utmost reluctance and would do nothing without consulting St Orsiasius, to whom he was deeply attached. They even took it in turns to make visitations of the various communities. After the death of St Theodore in 368, Orsiasius again assumed charge and he continued to rule alone until his death, the exact date of which is uncertain. He left as a legacy to his monks an ascetic treatise in the form of an abridged compendium of the rules and maxims of the religious life. St Jerome, at a later date, translated it into Latin. The next saint is St Landelinus Abbot, A.D. 686. I have to turn over and the page is not easy to turn. Some of these pages haven't been turned for a long time, I suspect. So, as the founder of the great abbeys of Lobs and Crespin and of two other less celebrated, St. Saint Landelinus was held in honour by succeeding generations though we do not know much about his life. He was born about the year 625 at Vaux near Bapaum of Frankish parents who entrusted him to Saint Outbertus Bishop of Cambrai, but at the age of 18 he broke away from his guardian and fell in with evil companions by whom he was led into robbery and other crimes. The sudden death of one of his associates roused him to a sense of danger A humble penitent, he returned to St. Outbertus and then determined to withdraw to one of the places of his former life, Lobs, in the hope of atoning in solitude for his past excesses. But he soon found himself surrounded by disciples who wished to imitate his life. They were the nucleus from which grew the Abbey of Lobs. Saint Landilinus constituted his follower, Saint Ursmar, its first abbot, for he regarded himself as totally unworthy to rule a religious house. And from Lobs he went to Aulne, and from thence to Wallens, where, according to one biographer, other communities sprang up round him. Still craving for solitude, he penetrated with St Adelinus and St Domitian into the vast forest which stretched between Mons and Valenciennes. Even here, he was followed 
and for his new disciples he founded the Abbey of Crespin, which he was obliged to govern himself. Nevertheless, he spent much of his time in a cell at some distance from the rest of the community. He is said to have died in 686 or thereabouts. And there's a lot of small writing underneath, but I can't read it. Now we're going to read about St. Edeburger of Winchester, Virgin, and A.D. 1960. Three Anglo-Saxon princesses, in the name of Egg Edeburger, are included in the calendars of the saints. The nun who is venerated on this day was the granddaughter of King Alfred and the daughter of King Edward the Elder. By his third wife, Ed Giver, her parents, who seemed to have destined her to the religious life from the cradle, determined to test her vocation when she was only three years old. Her father took her on his knees and showing her on one hand a chalice with a book of the Gospels and on the other a little pile of necklaces and bracelets, asked her to choose which she would have. The little girl eyed the trinkets with obvious aversion but held out her arms towards the sacred objects. She was placed in the abbey, which King Alfred's widow had founded at Winchester, and in due course rose to be abbess. She was famous for her charity, her humility and her miracles. It is recorded that she would sometimes rise during the night while the other nuns were sleeping and would silently remove their sandals and clean them and replace them beside their beds. Fame rested largely on the miracles her relics were believed to have worked and a short summary of these is to be found in one of the Harleian manuscripts at the British Museum. The next saint is Saint Bardo, Archbishop of Maine, A.D. 1053. Saint Bardo was born about the year 982 at Oppenschofen in Welterau, on the right bank of the Rhine. His parents, who were related to the Empress Gisela, sent him to be educated in the Abbey of Fulda, where he received the habit. In after days, his former fellow students like to recall how, when they found him poring over the famous book of St. Gregory on the duties of pastors, regular pastoralis, he had jokingly remarked in reply to their surprise, well, perhaps some silly king will make me a bishop some day, if no one else can be found for the work. So, I may as well learn how it should be done. About the year 1029, he was nominated abbot of Kaiserwerth by the Emperor Conrad II, and he subsequently became superior of Horsfield. Still higher promotion was in store for him. In 1031, after the death of Aribo, he was chosen to occupy 
the important metropolitan see of Mainz. In his new office, he retained all the simplicity and austerity of a monk, while dispensing alms and hospitality as befitted a bishop. He was esteemed by all classes, but made himself particularly the champion of the poor, whom he defended from their oppressors, and to whom his house was ever open. Bardo played an important part in two synods of Mainz, which met under the presidency of Pope Leo IX, to put down simony and to enforce clerical celibacy. The Pope took occasion on one of his visits to persuade Bardo to relax some of his austerities, which were undermining his health and threatened to shorten his life. Always stern within himself, the good Archbishop was extraordinarily merciful to others. Insults or wrongs against himself, he seemed never to resent. One day, at his own table, as he was denouncing the vice of intemperance, his eyes fell upon a young man whose mocking expression and tittering clearly indicated that he was making fun of his host. The archbishop ceased speaking and looked straight at the culprit. Then instead of administering the rebuke which all present expected, he took up a dish of food and directed that both the vessel and its contents should be presented to the young man. Bardo's kind heart also made him a lover of animals. He had a collection of rare birds, which, of which, many of which he had tamed, and had taught to feed from his hand. I don't think I'd do that with my birds. There's so many different ones, and some are big and some are small. Well, the small ones, the red robins, but who would, they're so nervous, aren't they? they? I don't think that could happen. Yeah, so his death took place on June the 10th, 1053. He was universally mourned, Jews as well as Christians, lamenting his loss. We have another saint at the bottom here. Got quite a few today. Saint Ali Dis. A-L-E-Y-D-I-S or Alice, A-L-I-C-E, which we know, Virgin, A.D. 1250. This is a very simple life, but it leaves the impression of an absolutely sincere record written down by a contemporary who was probably a Cistercian monk and confessor to the community. Ailey Dis was charming and delicate little girl, born at Sharbeek near Brussels, who at the age of seven seems of her own choice to have been committed to the care of a community of Cistercian nuns in the neighbouring convent called Camera Sanctae Mariae, which still survives in the Bois de la Cambre, just outside the city. She was, before all else, humble and retiring. There are some simple miracles recorded of her, such as the spontaneous relighting of a candle which had fallen and been extinguished 
and she devoted herself in every possible way to the service of her religious sisters. While still very young, she contracted leprosy and to the great sorrow of all the community had to be segregated. This was only the occasion we are told of her taking refuge more completely than before in the wounds of Christ. Her one comfort lay in the reception of Holy Communion. She was not, however, on account of possible contagion from her lips, touching the cup, allowed to receive in both kinds as others then did. And this was a matter of great distress to her until our Lord himself assured her that she lost nothing thereby. Where there is part, she was told, there also is the whole. On the feast of St. Barnabas, 1249, she suddenly became very ill and was anointed. But it was revealed to her that she would remain on earth yet a year longer. She then lived it on in great suffering, losing the sight of both eyes, but offering her pains for the souls in purgatory. Moreover, she was sustained by ecstasies and revelations, which came to her more and more frequently as the end drew near. A year later, on Friday, June the 10th, she was again anointed. And the next morning, Ali Dis happily breathed her last at daybreak on the feast of St. Barnabas. And now we have Blessed Jolenta of Hungary, widow, A.D. 1299. Jolenta, or Helena, as she is called by the Poles, was one of four sisters who are honoured with the title of Blessed. They were three daughters of Bella, the fourth king of Hungary, the nieces of Saint Elizabeth, the great niece of Saint Hedwig, and lineal descendants of the Hungarian kings, Saint Stephen and Saint Ladislaus. When she was five years old, Jolenta was committed to the care of her elder sister, Blessed Kunigund, or Kinga, who had married Bolslaus II, King of Poland. Under their fostering care, the little girl grew up a pattern of virtue. She became the wife of Duke Bolslaus of Kaulis, with whom she spent a happy married life. Both of them were addicted to good works and together they made various religious foundations. Jolenta was beloved by all, but especially by the poor, for whom she had a tender love. After the death of her husband, as soon as she had settled two of her daughters, she retired with the third and with blessed Kunigund, now like herself a widow, into the convent of poor Clare, which Kunigund had established at Sandek. Jolenta's later years, however, were spent at Gnesen, as superior of the convent of which she had been the foundress. She died there, in 1299. The next saint is called Saint Germain of Pibrac, Virgin, 
AD 1601. A simple, humble maiden... Uh, I'll start again, sorry. A simple maiden, humble and of lowly birth, but so greatly enlightened by the gifts of divine wisdom and understanding, and so remarkable for her transcendent virtues, that she shone like a star, not only in her native France, but throughout the Catholic Church. Such is the description of Saint Germain, cousin set down in the apostolic brief, which numbered her among the blessed. She was the daughter of Laurent Cousin, an agricultural labourer, and was born about the year 1579 at Pibrac, a village near Toulouse. Her mother, Marie Laroche, died when her little girl was scarcely out of the cradle. From her birth, Germaine suffered from ill health. She was scrofulous and her right hand was powerless and deformed. Her father had no affection for her, whilst his second wife actively disliked her. She treated her stepdaughter most harshly, and after the birth of her own children, she kept Germaine away from her healthier stepbrothers and sisters. The poor girl was made to sleep in the stable or under the stairs, was fed on scraps, and as soon as she was old enough, was sent out to mind sheep in the pastures. She was destined to remain a shepherdess for the rest of her life. Germaine accepted the treatment she received as though it were her due, and God made use of it to lead her to great perfection, out in the fields, alone with nature. She learned to commune with her divine creator, from whom she learnt directly all that she required to know. He spoke to her soul, as he speaks to the humble and clean of heart, and she lived ever consciously in his presence. Nothing could keep her from mass if she heard the bell when she was in the fields. She would plant her crook and her distaff in the ground, commend her flock to her angel guardian, and hurry off to church. Never once on her return did she find that a sheep had strayed or had fallen prey to the wolves that lurked in the neighbouring forest of Bucone, ever ready to pounce on unattended sheep. As often as she could, she made her communion and her fervour was long remembered in the village, although she took no part in the social life of her neighbours. And never mixed with girls of her own age. Yet she would often gather the young children round her to teach them the simple truths of religion and lead them to love God. Her neighbours at first accepted the estimate of her family and were disposed to despise her and turn her to ridicule. But gradually, strange stories began to circulate respecting her. To reach the church from the pasture land she had to cross a stream, which was sometimes swollen by the rain. On one occasion, when it had become a torrent 
so strong that men feared to cross. People said, Germain will not come to Mass today. But they were mistaken. And two villagers who had watched her at the stream confidently asserted that the waters had parted to let her cross just as the Red Sea had parted for the Israelites of old. It might have been thought that anyone so poor as Germain would be unable to exercise the corporal works of mercy. Love, however, can always find a way, and the scanty food that was grudgingly doled out to her was shared with beggars. Even this was made a cause for complaint. One cold winter's day, her stepmother pursued her with a stick, declaring that she was concealing stolen bread in her apron. To the amazement of the pitying neighbours who would have protected her, that which fell from the apron was not bread, but summer flowers. Contempt now gave way to veneration, and the inhabitants of Pibrac began to realise that they had a saint in their midst. Even her father and stepmother relented towards her. They would now have allowed her to take her proper place in their home. But Germain chose to continue to live as before. It was not for long. Her feeble frame was worn out. Her work on earth was done. And one morning she was found lying dead on her straw pallet under the stairs. She was 22 years old. Her body, which was buried in the church of Pibrac, was accidentally exhumed in 1644, 43 years after her death, and was found in perfect preservation. It was afterwards enclosed in a leaden coffin, which was placed in the sacristy. Sixteen years later, it was still flexible and well preserved. The circumstance and the numerous miracles which were ascribed to her encouraged a desire for official sanction of her cuitus. Owing to the French Revolution, however, and other hindrances, her beatification and canonization were deferred until the pontificate of Pius IX. An annual pilgrimage takes place on June 15th to Pibrac Church, where her relics still rest. That's the end of the saints for today, but what a facet. That, that's my favourite one out of all those I read today. Wonderful, wasn't it? Wonderful story. Wonderful life. See how God loves the humble and the. when she was treated as nothing, she accepted it all. She just humble, humble, humble. Whoa. Lovely story. Thank you so much for listening. May God bless you and heal you. I'm sending you his peace in abundance. May you always be happy and joyful in the Lord. And I'm going to end with the final prayer after reading sacred scripture as well as the saints. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for the word you've spoken to me through the treasure of the scripture. Make these words a living reality in my life, a constant guide, a lamp for my feet and a light to my path.
Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful rest of your day, morning, evening or whatever the time is. And I'm hoping to do, and I felt really comfortable in this new chair. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. It's, it's just what I've needed all this time. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy. I'm so, oh, it's so comfortable. It really is. It's made for me. <laughs> I'm grateful. Yes, I am. So I'm going to do some other recordings during the rest of the day. It's, it's about 4, four it's gone 4 o'clock. Yeah, I will do a Bible in one year. Maybe some more of a book or something. I've got lots to share. God bless and thank you so much for all your comments and sharing and good wishes God and prayers. Thank you.